Hi, this is Nancy Whiteman. I'm the CEO of Wanna Brands, and I am delighted to be able to be with you today on Professionally Cannabis. Hello, listener, and welcome to the Professionally Cannabis podcast. I am delighted to say that joining me for a conversation today is Nancy Whiteman, the co-founder and CEO of Wanna Brands, one of the leading names in cannabis retail. Most well known for their potent gummies, Wanna have blazed a trail for cannabis brands across the US and recently was subject to a $300 million acquisition by Canopy Growth. Nancy is an inspirational cannabis exec and someone who I cannot wait to speak with. So, Without further ado, Nancy, welcome to the Professionally Cannabis Podcast. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, and Nancy, as you'll know, our first and customary question is, what led you to the plant? Yes, and a great question that is too. So I was thinking about that and I was realizing that I this is a two-parter for me. So so my, my connection with the plant really is, I guess, twofold. One is just the personal connection that I had uh, at a pretty young age of enjoying the plant and using it recreationally myself. Um, but then, you know, there many years went by when it wasn't really uh, front and center in terms of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I had children and a busy life. And uh, then one day, uh, one of my children had a friend over and her dad was getting into the business. And we started talking with him about it. And long story short, ended up uh, for a brief period of time going into business together. And the interesting part about it is that at that point, I really didn't understand the health and wellness or medicinal uses of cannabis very well. I really was primarily a recreational user, and it really wasn't that I didn't believe in it. It's just that I didn't know that much about it. So I uh, got into it, uh, you know, thought this is going to be fun and exciting and what a lark this was going to be. Boy, did I have a lot to learn. Um, but then <laughs> what ended up happening was that we started to get just incredible feedback from people who are using our products in terms of how it was helping them with some very significant stuff. And it was like the proverbial light bulb went off for me, like, oh my gosh, this is real. And from that time on, I became very fascinated by the medicinal and health and wellness qualities of the plant um, and very committed to building a company that really respected the plant and, and uh, used it uh, to really help people with day-to-day -day stuff. Our, our tagline is enhance your life. And, and I feel like what our products do is that they help make people's day better. Uh, it, whether it's because I'm not sleeping well and now I can, or I was feeling anxious and now I'm feeling better, or I just wanted to relax and unwind, which for me is health and wellness as well. Uh, so that's really what my, my connection to the plant uh, began with. And it's only deepened over time. And Nancy, what do you think differentiates Wanna Brands from other folks who are out there in the market? There's no secret that the cannabis brands and retail space is, you know, particularly saturated and increasingly so. But of course, you know, in my intro, I mentioned that recently uh, Wanna and Canopy Growth have entered a, an acquisition deal. What what does it take to to build? A company specifically looking through the lens of you as a founder and, and CEO but what, what, what's it take to to build a company that eventually will be acquired for the amazing sums that we that we mentioned earlier <laughs> yes it's amazing to me too <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> um, you know uh, I, I I'm frequently asked uh, by people who are interested in getting into the industry what they should be focusing on and one of the things that's sort of interesting about Juana is that we truly are kind of a grassroots bootstrapped brand. So we got into the industry in 2010 when it was still quite new. We're in Colorado. And even in Colorado, which is one of the OG kind of markets, it was mm -hmm. still really quite new. And I think like many startups, we were trying to find our footing, right? So we tried a whole bunch of different products, everything from, you know, infused nuts to to beef jerky, all kinds of crazy stuff. But really, when we hit on the gummy as the format, then 
uh, I could see right away that that was going to be a major delivery system. And what we really focused on, since we didn't have oodles of money to build the most beautiful, sophisticated visual brand out there, we really focused on making a great product that was very effective and very, very consistent. And, you know, in Colorado back in the day, we didn't. We were not even required to do third-party lab testing for potency, for example, initially. But we did that right from the very first batch of products that we made because I always wanted people to really know and understand what their experience was going to be with a WANA product. And I think that commitment to product quality and consistency has been a hallmark of ours literally from day one. So I think that's incredibly important. I think the other thing that makes cannabis such a unique product is that, at least on the edible side of it, is that it's almost a a two-tiered experience. There's the sensory experience of I'm putting this in my mouth and eating it. And we spend a lot of time making sure that that's a really pleasant experience. Our flavors are delicious. Our textures are great. Our gummies don't melt. We've put a ton of, of time and resource into the sensory experience. But then the interesting thing that really distinguishes cannabis from other CPG-like products is that there's a whole other level of experience, and that's the effect or the experience that you have. How does it work? How does it make me feel? Can I count on this being consistent from time to time? Does it do what it says it's going to do? If we say this is a sleep product, does it actually make me fall asleep? So we pay extreme attention to both of those elements of the product, the sensory experience and then the actual effect. So that's part one. That's kind of the underpinnings. I don't care how beautiful your brand looks. If your products are not good, I think there's you know little chance that you're going to be successful mm-hmm, long term. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the second thing that I would point to is that we got into the geographic expansion aspect of the business early. Um, and I, I like to say, you know, we, we also made our mistakes early. We certainly did our share of things that I look back on and I kind of do a face plant and what was I thinking on that one. But we learned early and we started to put our uh, market expansion infrastructure in place early and t- uh, really understood what it meant to deeply support our partners um, and to be successful in a given market. So that was a key to our success, getting to markets quickly and early and and with consistency and quality. So having the right infrastructure to train our partners, to do quality assurance, to make sure that the products were the same market to market. And then the third thing that I would mention is that we made a very deep commitment to innovation. And I really believe that we are still in, you know, early stages of understanding all the things that this amazing plant can do. Um, But we have always been, um, at the forefront of everything that one can do to take the maximum advantage of the plant Um, and constant improvement just in the core products. So, you know, when I think of what our product was like 10 years ago and when I think of what it's like now, you know, now we have replaced corn syrup with tapioca syrup. We've moved to organic ingredients. Um, We have stabilized the the recipe. We've added uh, all kinds of different ratios and classes, uh, quick onset products, use case specific products. And we have a very deep product innovation pipeline that goes for about two years at this point uh, with new products that that we are going to be releasing. And in Colorado, we actually are soft launching um, what I, so far as I know, the first quick onset live rosin gummy in the market. So um, I would I would point to all of those things. And then, you know, you have to you've got to really think of each of your markets almost like little separate businesses, because Mm. every market is very, very different. And it's not a one size fits all kind of a proposition in cannabis. So you have to really um, think locally and customize your your marketing and your sales efforts um, to address the needs of a given market. So those are some of the things that I think have contributed to our success. And and looking at your journey from 2010, at what point for you did the business go from feeling like a bootstrapped startup to a, you know, quite sizable corporate? And how did you navigate that 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 change, that growth, everything, you know, from product range to team and and everything in the middle? Oh, that's such a great question. I I think um, 
One of the things about being a founder is that you start out doing everything yourself. You're wearing all the different hats, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And as the company grows, and I would say we were at least five years in, I'd say before I started to feel like there really was, you know, some stability to the business and, you know, we were scaling the way I wanted to see a scale. And by the way, a lot of that happened post adult use legalization in Colorado. Um, that really enabled us to scale and, and ramp our, our sales in a way that we hadn't been able to do before. Um, so I think it's really, you know, as, as one of the founders of the company, it really is a process of, of letting go and finding people who are better than you are at all of their own areas, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I love my team and I, I often say with great sincerity that every single one of them is better at their job than I could ever be. So I think it really is um, having that instinct for when it's time to add people, um, having a good instinct for who you need uh, and what the business needs at that point in time, and then getting out of their way, you know, being there still uh, to support and, and to be uh, an advocate uh, and always to have everybody's back. But to understand that to let a company grow, you have to stop trying to do everything yourself and you have to stop trying to control everything yourself. And Nancy, earlier you mentioned about sort of targeting geographical expansion quite, quite early in your journey and and you are totally right especially looking at the the u.s market being a product which is federally illegal and with each state having their own regulatory system essentially moving into each new state is like moving into a into a new country and of course there are regulatory regimes uh, different cultures and everything else that that comes with uh, a new environment when you're when you're targeting new states what what in particular are you are you looking for Yes. So that's a great question, too. And um, it, it's both art and science, I guess I would say, you know, on the completely sort of objective side of things, we're really looking at a lot of different variables that some of them are quite objective and some of them are less so. On the objective side, when we're looking at a medical state, for example, we're looking at what are the allowable conditions in that state? We're looking at how many people are likely to qualify uh, for those, uh, who gets to write the, the medical prescriptions or uh, who can certify the cards. Um, all of these things add up to how large the market is likely to be. We're also looking at if there appears to be a pathway to adult use. One of the things that we've done very successfully is launch in medical markets that then have converted to adult use. And our brand reputation has already been established. We're already a key player in that marketplace. And then, you know, as it switches over to adult use, we're in a great position for that. Um, so those are some of the more tangible things. On the adult use side, of course, we're looking at total population size. Um, but we're also looking at the structure of the market. Is it a limited license market like the East Coast markets tend to be where there's a uh, a set number of licenses uh, that requires one kind of structure and support? Is it an unlimited license market, which the West Coast markets tend to be more like that? Colorado, California, Oregon would all fall into that category. Or somewhere in the middle, which the, the Midwest markets tend to be kind of the limited license, but not nearly as limited as the East Coast licenses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all of those have huge implications, first of all, for who you're going to partner with. They have implications for how you're going to structure the partnership, um, how you're going to support it from a sales and marketing perspective. So we're looking at all of those things. And then it also comes down to, can we find a partner that we vibe with? You know, somebody who we think is going to um, really respect the brand, mm. uh, is going to act like a true partner to us. Um, so it's a combination of all of those things. We're looking at market size, fit, and long-term potential. And, and when you're expanding into new states, are you guys looking to have specific WANA boots on the ground or, or is that physical presence often uh, taken up by, by sort of partners of yours? Well, you know, Jonathan, I have a little bit of a joke, which I'm sure my entire team is sick of hearing at this point. But <laughs> I always I always joke that um, there's many questions in cannabis, but there's only one answer. And the answer is always, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's also the answer here. It depends. And it kind of goes back to what I was just talking about, the structure of the market and, and the partner and how the partner 
is is structured. So we can get into um, relationships, for example, where it's just a pure contract manufacturer, right? And we're putting our own um, sales and marketing resources into the market, sort of the boots on the street approach. We also have relationships where the partner has a well-established sales team. Um, and they already have uh, longstanding and tight relationships in that marketplace. And so the most expedient thing for us to do is to work with their marketing team, but perhaps put in field marketing reps or brand ambassadors or other types of marketing support. Um, and part of it has to do with, with the partner and their business model. So, for example, if they have a product that directly competes with our product, but they have excess capacity so that they, they do want to do the manufacturing on it, that's sometimes a signal to us that we should put our own sales team in because it can mm -hmm. be hard sometimes for a sales team to have to sell a house brand and, and another brand as well. So we have a variety of different models that we customize for the needs of the partner in the market. And talking of sales teams, I'm sure your sales folks are around the country are, are, are constantly looking to HQ to see what the latest and greatest new innovation and, and products are. And, and, and in that, how do you approach innovation and, and R&D at Warner Brands? How involved are you personally? And what does that sort of central core team who are responsible for the, the I guess, future of next generational Warner products look like? Yes. Well, I, this is one area that I have stayed extremely involved in um, because I consider it to be one of the lifebloods of the, the company is innovation. Um, I really do believe that um, the brands that are going to succeed long term are those who are constantly innovating. Uh, I Or they're going to be willing to uh, compete on, on a low cost basis which actually I would just make a side comment here, I think is a, is a very challenging strategy in cannabis. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, in, in most other industries, if you want to pursue a cost leadership business strategy, you, you can do that if you can scale, right? But when you're in a situation where every state is its own market, you can't really get the kind of scale that you need to drive down costs to implement a successful cost leadership strategy, which basically means right now that the brands who you see doing that are, are not pursuing what I would consider to be a strategic cost leadership strategy. They're pursuing a let's get enough revenue in the door to stay open for another couple of months strategy. And they're, mm. most of them are not making much money. So that's not our strategy. Our strategy is a highly differentiated strategy where we create products that that earn the right to charge a premium because they're differentiated and they add uh, more value. So that's a little bit of background sort of philosophically. In terms of um, my involvement, I work extremely closely with our VP of Innovation, who is wonderful and brilliant. His name is Mike Hennessy. Um, and oh, I met him years ago in Israel, as it goes. Oh, did you? Yes, okay. yes. I was there as well. Yes. <laughs> Um, he's wonderful. And so we start out with really constantly keeping an eye on what is it that our needs that people have that cannabis can meet? You know, is it um, sleep? Is it anxiety? Is it weight loss? Is it intimacy? Is it sports recovery, immune, gut health? All of the things that we know cannabis can be effective for. And then we prioritize them. Uh, and, and often the prioritization is happening in terms of what are the things that people are, are bringing out most frequently. But we created actually a whole product line for our gummies called Wana Optimals. And that's where all of our use case specific products live is under the Optimals sub brand of Wana. So right now, the two products we have on the market are our fast asleep product, which is a quick onset sleep product. Fantastic for people who have trouble falling asleep. Um, and then we also have Wana Fit, which is a THCV product. And THCV is an interesting sort of paradoxical cannabinoid mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. that, uh, whereas we think of THC as giving us the munchies and, and making us kind of, you know, relax on the couch. THCV is just the opposite. It has appetite suppressant qualities and it's good for focus. Um, so those are our two new products, but we have a long lineup of, of additional products that are in development, uh, two of which will be out in the next uh, quarter or two quarters. Um, so Mike and his team 
are actually taking our priorities and what they are doing is they are then beginning to work on formulation. And how that typically works is they do very deep dives into all of the research. Speaking of Israel, there was a lot of that there. All of the research that's available on uh, cannabinoids, how they function, how you combine them. And then they start doing the formulation. And we do very extensive sensory testing on our formulations, particularly the use case specific formulations. Um, you know, there's there's no point in coming out with a sleep product that's basically a distillate gummy with a little bit of CBN thrown in there if it's not really effective. Mm -hmm. So our products tend to be highly formulated, um, more sophisticated really than a lot of uh, other products that are on the market. Um, and we do a lot of testing. It's not unusual for us to go through four or five iterations of formulation before we have something where everybody's kind of giving the thumbs up and saying, boy, this really worked. Um, so uh, while we're, we're making sure that it works well, we're also making sure, going back to my comment before about the two levels, we're also making sure that the things that we're adding to it don't uh, detract from having a pleasant sensory experience. It still tastes really good. It still chews well, all of that good stuff. So it's, uh, it's a, an iterative process, and sometimes it can be a long process. When we came out with our quick onset uh, gummies, for example, that was almost a two-year R&D process. We tested every quick onset technology that we could find in the marketplace to really look for something that truly was quick and also did not uh, negatively impact the taste of the product. So because some of these are long-term uh, projects, we have a lot of things that are going simultaneously that we're working on and testing. So that's a little bit about how we, we do it. And the other thing that I would say is that we are constantly scanning uh, the marketplace to see what's happening out there. What are the trends? Uh, we are just getting ready to launch in Colorado um, the live rosin products that I, that I mentioned before. And so one of the things that we were looking at as we were evaluating live rosin is how do we create a process where we can scale it? Because a lot of the live rosin products are sort of strain specific and they they have sort of a scarcity model. We're doing a drop of this next week, and when it's gone, it's gone. And mm -hmm. that's kind of fun from a marketing point of view, but it's not especially sustainable from a revenue point of view. So we are simultaneously evaluating a lot of different things, uh, and one of them is scalability, and the other is can we make this work in multiple markets? Because different markets have different rules about – uh, cannabinoid use, functional ingredient use, different supply chain issues. So it's kind of like a simultaneous uh, equation that we're trying to solve for multiple variables at the same time. And and when you are evaluating the, the marketplace, the, the landscape for, for cannabis products, what sort of criteria do you, do you take and do you use when looking at perhaps competitor products or other, be it form factors, delivery mechanisms, or sort of other unique selling points of these products. What what criteria do you use to evaluate whether what you're seeing could be the next big thing and perhaps what might be a, a gimmick which will come and go in six to eight months? Great question. Um, part of it is... Um data driven and part of it is is intuition and gut and staying close to the market. So on the data driven side of things we're constantly looking at, you know, headset and BDSA and and other analytics mm -hmm, information mm -hmm. like that and we're looking at what is trending. Okay? So there that's kind of that piece of it and of course we're constantly in dispensaries ourselves and our sales teams are always there seeing kind of what what is in the marketplace. But you make a really good point in terms of, you know, I, I, I like to say you can't boil the ocean, right? You can't do everything at once. And I think where a lot of companies go wrong, and cannabis companies especially, is you do have to focus, right? You can't do everything. And so um, every new idea that comes along, if you go chasing after everything, you're not going to do any of them especially well. So you do have to have a level of discernment. Now, on the product format side of things, we, as you might know, we have really focused on, on gummies as the primary platform. And as I said right at the beginning, when we started out, we had a, you know, a lot of different products from baked goods to candy to beef jerky, et cetera. But what we really found is that gummies 
were an ideal platform for us. So that simplifies things. Um, people, because of the vitamin, uh, the fact that people, many people now take their vitamins in gummy format, people have become very accustomed to eating one gummy, right? And that feels satisfying and okay. We were just joking yesterday, I was at a meeting and uh, we were all joking about how nobody really just wants to eat one little piece of chocolate. <laughs> There's something <laughs> sort of inherently not satisfying about that. And I would say too that I think that that's part of the reason why the savory products have always struggled a little bit is that, you know, from a, from a production point of view, um, people don't want to eat one cracker. That's not real satisfying either. They want a whole bag of crackers. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a whole, you have to produce a whole bag and package a whole bag of crackers to get one serving out there. So it's not very efficient from a production perspective. So in some ways we've simplified our lives by saying gummies are our primary product format. They're not the only, but they're the primary. So that means that we can just focus on what are all the cool things that you can do within the gummy format. And fortunately, it's a very flexible format and you can do a lot within that. Um, but we're looking for things that I would say are uh, broad trends. So for example, I would say full plant extraction with the live rosin is what I would say is a broad trend. I think People want the kind of entourage effect that you can get from smoking where you're getting everything that's in the plant. They want that in an edible format. So that would be something that I would say we look across the universe and say this is something that we think will be a lucrative long term trend for for us to get into. Um, but I also feel that there is things that are driven by, you know, I think we're a very values based company. And so there's things that I think are driven by what can we do to contribute to people having a better life, right? And people being able to sleep well, people being less anxious, um, all of those things are big drivers for us as well. Uh, and they help us set our product priorities also. So like I said about choosing out-of-state markets, it's it's similar on, on the product innovation side is that you do have to, you have to make your bets, you have to be focused, and you have to take a variety of different uh, criteria into account when you're choosing where you're going to focus. And and moving away from the product side of things now, Nancy, I, I'd love us to focus on corporate social responsibility. Now, this is uh, a, a big term uh, across all industries and, and, and something that cannabis execs have to have to pay attention to and not just pay attention to really and really be actively engaged in, uh, you know, beneficial uh, uh, initiatives that, that, they're, that they're putting out there. Now, Nancy, what does corporate social responsibility mean to you? And just how important do you believe it is that cannabis execs are, are, are driving CSR and equity initiatives forward, uh, you know, across the, the, the many states that they're operating in? Yes. Well, I think it's critical. Um, and, and not just for cannabis, I think it's, it's critical for business in, in general. Uh, in terms of what it means to me, it, it means to me that um, we have to see ourselves as part of the larger ecosystem of how society functions. And we have to be thinking about how do we positively contribute to that? How do we um, add value to the communities in which we do business? In addition to our products, how do we as a company add value? And I think one of the things, uh, and, and of course, like, like all things uh, company and brand related, things evolve over time. You know, our first couple of years in business, we were just trying to keep the doors open, mm -hmm, frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, But when we started to really turn our attention towards co corporate social responsibility, um, one of the things that I really wanted for WANA was that it not be something that just be siloed off in a corner somewhere, that it sort of be part of how we, how we function, right? So when we are coming out with, with a new product, for example, um, we look for opportunities to work with nonprofits um, that are aligned with that. So, you know, if, if we're coming out with the fit product, which is um, a product about um, appetite, we might look to partner, <coughs> excuse me, with um, 
with nonprofits who work in the area of food security, right? So that there's a tie-in for that. For 420 this year, for example, we uh, we have rebranded 420 as Forward 20 because we feel like 420, we're, we're not, this isn't a brand new industry anymore where everybody's just all excited that they get to consume cannabis legally. It's now a significant and legitimate industry and 420 should be more than a big party. It should be a celebration of cannabis and all the ways that it can possibly, possibly, positively impact lives. So what we're doing in each of our markets, and we're in 13 markets in the U.S. and launching in four more right now, um, and, and another nine markets in Canada, um, we're finding nonprofit partners in each of those markets, and we are... Um, partnering with them and they're all around the issue of food security. So, you know, for example, one nonprofit puts, uh, you know, grocery stores in with fresh produce in food desert areas. And, you know, there's, there's um, ones that uh, help school age children uh, with, with um, making sure that they have adequate food uh, during the day, a whole bunch of different stuff, but kind of all around uh, the topic of food. Um, the other thing that I would say about cannabis specifically is that, of course, we know in the U.S. that the war on drugs was very cynically and deliberately targeted mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. people of color who have disproportionately paid the price for uh, for using cannabis, uh, for, you know, really uh, nonviolent minor cannabis crimes. Of course, we know the statistics on incarceration. And so I really feel that that cannabis owes those people sort of a, a, a debt. Uh, and that's what a lot of the social equity programs are about. Uh, we are long-term supporters of a, a project called the Last Prisoner Project, mm -hmm. which is dedicated to getting um, people who are still currently incarcerated for minor nonviolent cannabis crimes out of jail and back into a full life. Uh, so we do a lot of support of uh, social equity and, and BIPOC uh, cannabis entrepreneurs. Um, we do a lot with voting rights. Uh, we, I, I believe personally that without fair access to voting, our democracy is at risk. So that's something that I want to see, want to support. Um, and, and sustainability. We were one of the first brands to move to biodegradable packaging. Um, and we do a variety of things, both internally and in the community, uh, to support that. We are uh, the only cannabis sponsor of a Colorado initiative called uh, Water 22, which is focused on bringing awareness of water usage to Colorado and education and tactics about uh, being uh, you know, educated consumers of water. So we do a whole range of things. I think one of the most exciting things for me, you mentioned the Canopy transaction, um, and one of the things that I was personally able to do from that transaction was to set up a private foundation. Uh, and it's it's going to be titled the Wanna Brands, uh, the Wanna Brands Foundation. And that's going to enable us to participate at um, a larger level to support some of the, the areas that we feel are important. And, and Nancy, perhaps a, a final question and building on sort of what we were speaking about there for for, for company execs that might be listening to this and listening to, to the amazing initiatives that, that you mentioned that, that one are a spearheading at the moment, and if they're thinking, hey, we, we really need to bolster our CSR and, and equity initiatives, but, but perhaps they don't know where to start, where should they start? Well, you know, I'm a huge believer in starting at the community level. Um, one of the things that we try to do in our markets is to engage with the community and find out what their priorities are. I think there's a danger, philanthropically speaking, of thinking that you have the answers, where I think the right place to start is with what the community sees as its issues. Now, you know, given that, I also think that anybody who's interested in giving usually has some things that are near and dear to their heart, some things that are important to them. And I think that that's also a great place to start. So I would, I would suggest that people start with a combination of those two things. What do you care about personally? And then how, does, um, how do the needs of the community um, dovetail with that? Well, I think that's fantastic advice and a, and a lovely place for us to, to close this off. Nancy, a pleasure as always speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us on Professionally Cannabis. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. 